Origins of the book uh, were actually in the last book, in From Poverty to Power, where um, I, I just, it struck me at the time, and this came out in 2008, a while ago, that it's odd that you can't go to a department of change studies somewhere and say, could you please explain to me how social and political change happens? You go to a history department, you get one explanation, you go to an economics department, you get another, and everybody, uh, when you meet people you know, post-university, you meet them in different bits of the aid and development industry, and it's pretty easy to tell what they studied because they'll have carried with them that particular understanding of change. And they will argue furiously with other people and not realize that actually it's just a sort of interdisciplinary clash sort of 20 years on. Um, so the idea of the book is to try and sort of bring a few things together, a few different disciplines. Um, I, I studied physics a long time ago, so I have a very odd take on a lot of this stuff. Um, but I sort of become a kind of closet economist by spending far too much time with economists. But actually, some of my best friends are historians, so I'm sort of trying to, trying to have this conversation in my own head as much as anything else. So this is not a new conversation, 6th century BC or BCE. Um, Karl Marx, I've actually, you know, I, I think Karl Marx uh, went too far. So he, he said the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. If you work in an organization like Oxfam, people are only interested in changing it, and you just wish they would spend a bit more time interpreting the world. So this is a kind of attempt to redress the balance a bit, because there's a sort of knee-jerk activism thing where, you know, something must be done, this is something, let's do it becomes the sort of mantra, and that's n almost as bad as just you know, philosophizing and not trying to change the world. So I think we may have gone a bit too far. Oops, sorry. Um, the audience for the book, now development, as you know, in the aid business is full of the most awful jargon, phrases, appalling sort of, and there's a kind of a big industry in constantly developing new and obscure phrases as well, because if you can sort of come up with a new piece of jargon, then that, that makes your career. Um, and change agents is the best I can manage with the kind of people who I want to read this. I don't want it to be just activists, people who are out you know, on the streets protesting. I want it to be people who are in the private sector, in government, and you, or academia, people who are trying to think about and bring about change. So I'm afraid it looks a bit James Bondish, um, although very few people in the aid business look like James Bond, sadly. <laughs> um, but there we go. That's the best phrase I could come up with with the audience. Um, the way I've approached it, and this, didn't, this wasn't originally planned, it just kind of emerged from lots of thinking and reading and blogging, was that I've, I come in with the thinking about systems, trying, trying to get away from linear ideas of change and thinking about how systems change and the role of power and social norms. Um, and that's the sort of starting point, and that's what I'll talk about mainly today. After that, then we romp through the institutions that either are drivers of change in themselves, or the targets of people who are trying to create change. So the different aspects of the state, the legal system, the sort of mechanisms for accountability, political parties, media, social accountability, and then the international system and those big bad guys, the uh, t transnational corporations, um, with whom I spend a lot of time working and trying to make stuff happen. So there's interesting discussions to be had there about the role of the private sector. And then coming back more to sort of the people I, um, I work for and with, which is the change actors themselves, civic, civic activism um, of one kind or another, um, discussion on advocacy. So I think civic activists are doing it for their own communities. Advocacy is kind of doing it for other people, very broadly distinguished. Um, and then I got very interested in the whole question of leadership, which is something I think we underestimate um, and trying to understand how leadership emerges and different models of leadership, I think, is quite important in all this. And the classic development book has a great big diagnosis of what's wrong with the world. It may well have some policies at the end of it, but actually there's not much in terms of what do we do differently. So, um, so the, the, I spent a lot of time on trying to, trying to get to the so what's. The, okay, so Monday morning, you know, I'm going into the office. Should I do anything differently or do I just say I, spent, I wasted my weekend reading yet another book on aid and development? Um, so um, I'll talk about the first bit and the last bit, and I'll skip the bit in the middle for the interest of time. So systems and power. Um, the origins of the book um, came partly from a, a, a trip I made in 2006 to a particularly sort of parched and miserable bit of uh, India called, the, called Bundelkant um, in, in Madhya Pradesh. And I came across this really interesting story of change of uh, a fishing community. 
Um, and the really good thing I did was last month I went back there, 10 years on, and was hugely relieved to find that it's carried on doing really well. Because another typical feature of aid development is you find a good story, never go back because it's probably gone horribly wrong for some reason. This one was, no, they were still doing really well. I breathed a huge sigh of relief because a lot of the book is pinned on it. Um, they were traditional fisher fishing communities. Again, there's no right politically acceptable term for what they, who they are. Fisher folk sounds awful. Fishing communities, fishers. Anyway, um, they are fishing communities who, who fish these very large lakes, which are, uh, have, have been there for, you know, they're man-made, um, but they've been there for a thousand years. Um, and about in the sort of 80s, someone found out that if you seed the lakes with fish fry, productivity goes up massively, and suddenly you can make a lot of money out of these ponds, they call them. They're rather bigger than ponds, as, as, as you would call them in England. Um, and that was disastrous, because suddenly they were very profitable, which means that a whole load of upper caste uh, private sector types came in, got rid of the, uh, the fishing communities. They, you know, they had all the contacts, all the muscle, drove them off, and took control of the ponds. So the first thing that happened was a technology shift, led to a change in prices, led to uh, a negative result. Twelve fishermen uh, decided to protest. And uh, this was a, they're from quite a low caste in that uh, area, and this was quite a, uh, a scary and brave thing to do. They got beaten up, but they started to get momentum, started to get other fishing families joining in, other fishing communities. There was one particular fight where I think uh, someone was killed, and that became a kind of rallying point for the, uh, for the community. And then in comes an NGI, a non-governmental individual, right, um, uh, who are much more common than you think. This, this, this guy was a, a Brahmin. Um, I, I met him last month. He's resplendent in white, absolutely, you know, and people were kissing, touching his feet and kissing his feet. It was, you know, India's just another, another world, really. Um, and he knew everybody. He knew the chief of police. He knew the, uh, you know, he knew the, 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 the politicians. And he brokered links for these lower caste fishermen to talk to the people in power. And suddenly they started getting results. They were lucky in that the fishing minister at the state level was an ex-fisherman from this community. So he listened to them. And they started to get new policies, new laws. And they started to form cooperatives. And they started to take back control of the ponds. It's carried on since then, and as of last month, they had 250 ponds under community control. 23 of those are women-run, because there's kind of been the normative shift around women's rights in India has been quite strong. And the men and the women agreed that um, the women-run ponds are the most productive, um, because uh, they, are, they work harder, and because if there's any trouble, the police come really quickly, because they're particularly worried about violence against women. Um, so there's been some interesting shifts just that, that are reflected in, in that aspect. And I could see the contrast between this visit and 10 years ago in terms of the, 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 the voice of women. For the first time, I think, in my entire career in Oxfam or anywhere else, I actually had to say, could the women shut up, please? I'd like to hear what the men have to say, which, I, which is a completely unprecedented experience. But the, men were ex uh, the women were extraordinarily kind of forceful and confident, and that wasn't the case even 10 years ago. So that was interesting. So pulling all that together made me think about technology, made me think about alliances between unusual suspects, the role of the Brahmin, um, the role of organization, the role of conflicts and critical junctures. You know, there's a lot in there about the way change happens on the ground. And what it doesn't do is obey the logic of the aid business. And so after that introduction, I just want to talk a little bit about what's wrong with the aid business. And the basic problem with the aid business is the cake, right? To make a cake, you need ingredients, you need an oven, you need a recipe. And whoever you are, wherever you are, if you follow the recipe, you'll get something may not look as nice as that, but it will be recognizably a cake, and it will be edible. The project, OK? This is the project. For a project, you need ingredients, you know, activities, people, staff, partners. You need um, uh, a recipe, best practice, toolkit, whatever you call it. And the oven of implementation will produce a cake, and the cake is development. Okay? Um, 
This is, you know, they, projects emerge from infrastructure, from sort of things like building stuff, roads, bridges. It's become almost impossible to think in the aid business without thinking in terms of projects. Wherever you go, people come up to you and say, can I tell you about my project? Um, Try and imagine a world where there are no projects. How would you do aid differently? It's kind of a useful intellectual experiment because actually if you're working on women's rights, if you're working on legal empowerment, if you're working on anything, you have to think of it in terms of projects. The trouble is that the world often looks more like this. Okay? This is a US military uh, stakeholder map from Afghanistan. When it was leaked, um, everybody laughed at it. I looked at it and I thought, that's great. Someone's really made a, a serious effort to understand who talks to who and who influences who in a complex system. The essence of a complex system is that it's not the same as a complicated system. A complicated problem is getting a rocket to the moon. If you have lots of PhDs and lots of computer power and good engineers, you can get a rocket to the moon and get it back again. A complex system is something else entirely. If you poke a complex system with 10,000 US Marines or $100 million of aid, effects will ripple through. And there are so many connections and feedback loops, it is absolutely impossible to know what the effects will be. You cannot predict the action of an intervention, the results of an intervention in the system. And when there is a change in the system, you can't attribute it to any one intervention. And this is how society looks, economies look, polities look. And we are operating all the time in systems like this with a mental model of the cake. So what do you do? Well, you um, lie. You find, oh, look, that looks a little linear bit there. So oh, great, I can do a project there. Right? So you say, I know, I'll do vaccines in Pakistan because you know, vaccines are simple. You vaccinate kids and uh, they, they don't get ill. So there you've got a nice little project that you can get funding for. And then some idiot uses a doctor to spy on Osama bin Laden and the whole thing goes horribly wrong because the rest of the system intervenes. So even when you find a little island of linearity, you have to be aware that the rest of the system is liable to mess it up. So the book is about how you, how do you operate in this system, I guess. But I'll, last word on that one to um, uh, no one, unless it starts working out. No? Yeah, key features of change. So some of the things that are different in, in, in an Afghan type system, critical junctures. If there was one thing I wish organizations like Oxfam could do better, it's be better at noticing windows of opportunity and responding to them. The only people in the NGO sector or the aid sector, really, who are good at this are the humanitarians who, who naturally think in terms of interruptions and sudden moments and how you respond to them. Everywhere else, you know, new government, new leader, sc crisis scandal is largely seen as an annoying interruption of your carefully honed plan of your cake, right? So critical junctures, absolutely. And the interesting thing is these features are uh, just as true of that fishing experiment, in, uh, fishing uh, story in Tikhamgar as at the global level. It's like sort of Russian dolls or fractals. They get the same features at different scales. Um, path dependence, one thing leads to another. Therefore, every place is different and best practice is in really very limited as a guide to what to do. Um, Uncertain causation, as I talked about, a nightmare for all your monitoring and evaluation people. Because you, if you can't actually attribute change to what you did, how honest are you going to be with the funders? So I have to boil all this down to simple stuff for my friends and colleagues at Oxfam because they don't like long words, they don't like complexity, they really hate the word complexity, they don't like systems. So I boil it down to saying, OK, how do you plan when you don't know what is going to happen? And how do you campaign when you don't know what the solution is to the problem? And those are two useful ways to sum this up in terms of the challenge for, for activists, I think, in general. Mike Tyson, not my favorite guy, but a very good quote. Um, so that sort of sums it up, really, in terms of um, the experience of doing aid, the experience of trying to implement your plan. OK. <coughs> Um, there's a moment in the first Matrix film. Okay, don't watch the others. If you, I mean, if you can avoid watching the others, that's good because they're awful. But the first Matrix film, um, uh, the sort of messiah figure, um, a very beautiful Keanu Reeves in an amazing coat, um, 
suddenly sees ma the matrix as a series of ones and zeros which underlie, which is the actual reality beneath the reality, beneath life as he sees it. And he becomes invincible when he does that. The reason it's up here is because I've started feeling a bit like that about power. The, the underlying field of development is power. Okay? The, re the, the existing distribution of power and the maldistribution of power is what we're trying to fix, and we're trying to fix it through redistribution of power in different ways. So if we can just get activists better at seeing the power in this room, in this community, in this conversation, and seeing how it might be redistributed in a more progressive way, that would go a long way, not to making us invincible, but making us a bit less rubbish, I think, uh, would be as high as I would put it. So the book has a big chunk on um, uh, different ways of looking at power. There's no one way to look at power. I'm at university, so I have to put Foucault on a slide. You know, this is to demonstrate that I... This is the only quote from Foucault I ever understood, so I was very, <laughs> very excited about it, and so I thought I'd put it up there. Um, it's about the gaze, you know, the, the, the way that people self-repress. You know, women do it, indigenous people do it. Any, any lowers confronted with uppers in Robert Chambers' world suffer from this interiorized uh, sense of powerlessness. And that's often the first thing we, yeah, that we tackle or that is tackled in processes of change, is overcoming the gaze and that interiorized gaze. Um, it's this great quote from Guatemala, and I love this photo because you, you, know, you can spend hours talking about what's going on in the photo, but uh, I'll let you read it. So in gender work in particular, an awful lot of the work is not about policies, it's not about um, laws, it's about dealing with this and, and the, the light bulb moment. You know, um, which I, and I've had these conversations in so many countries and so many communities. People talk about the light bulb moment. They used to say, I used to kind of blank it out when people say, oh, it was that NGO seminar that changed my life. I thought, no, that can't be true. But actually enough people have said it to me that I now believe it, or some, some element of it, that there's this light bulb moment when you feel a sense of your own entitlements, your own value, and you start to demand things. And that fits very nicely with a model from a woman called Jo Rowlands, um, who talked about the four powers, that the first, you know, the first step is this sense of power within. Yeah, the, the, I have rights. People shouldn't be allowed to hit me. Um, uh, and once you achieve that sense of power within, then you start to look around and see people in similar situations, and you start to organize, and that's power with. And once you have power with, you have power to make demands and power over people with resources of power or money. And it's not a sequential thing, it's not a linear thing, but if you, it's a way of disaggregating all this mess of power which you're surrounded by. So I find that useful. I find the, the, the visible, hidden, and invisible ways of thinking about power useful. But they're all ways to try and make the power visible in the room. Oh, sorry. An example from Tajikistan, because that was all a bit theoretical. So I went to Tajikistan and was working with our um, Tajik staff there who were working on water and sanitation. Um, and they're trying to get communities to, in a profoundly disempowered post-Soviet um, context, to take responsibility for their own water and to support them in doing that, water and sanitation. And so we were, we were having a workshop and I asked them to do a power analysis of the village. You know, who has power in the village? And they did a classic NGO thing, activist thing. They said, well, there's the state and then there's the people. And we have to encourage the people, as rights holders, to make demands on the state as duty bearers. Now, I really hate the rights-based approach because it makes people think stupidly like that. Um, so, then we, so then we said, fine, that's the starting point. Tell me more about the village. Who actually has power in the village? And then suddenly they started saying, well, actually the truck driver's interesting because the person who drives the truck, the man who drives the truck, goes to lots of villages, he, bring, he carries information and news, he becomes a fit, quite an authority figure in the, in the villages. So it's quite useful to be in touch with them. And then the doctor's great because, you know, everybody trusts the doctor and the local teacher. And the imam, if you have bad dreams, you go to the imam to explain what the bad dreams meant. And uh, actually the lover of the mayor is a very influential figure in a lot of villages. If you can get to the, the lover of the mayor, then, then you've got a, a way into people in authority. And suddenly there was this whole ecosystem of power which emerged beyond citizens and states. 
And that, well, that's when it got interesting, because then we were talking about, OK, so if you map these on a very crude, how influential are they? How much do they agree with what we're saying on water and sanitation? If they agree but are uninfluential, you see how you can get them up in terms of influence, maybe through getting them to ally with each other, come up with a common plan. If they're very influential but they don't agree with you, how do you persuade them? What persuades them? So just by thinking of it in terms of a proper stakeholder map and how you shift things around, you start to turn the power analysis into something like a strategy. So that's what, it's just an example of how we do it, um, you know, actually in practice. Okay. When I showed all this to my, my, poor, my poor son, okay, I have two guinea pigs, both of them are my sons. One is a community activist in, in South London, and one works for DFID, although, um, that, that, uh, yeah, never mind. Uh, you've got to do something when you graduate, haven't you? Um, anyway, I showed it to the activist one, um, uh, and he said, that's all great, yeah, fantastic, but I'm not going to remember this when I'm in the meeting. You know, this is like 150 pages you made me read. Um, so boil it down to you know, one page. And I said, but the whole point of the book is you can't have blueprints. There's no single set tick boxes. He said, yeah, but if you don't do that, it's not going to be any use to me. And he is the kind of target audience for the book. So, so what I tried to boil it down to was something which is not quite a set of tick boxes, but is a set of questions to ask and sort of ways to think and feel and work. And I've called it the parent systems approach for lack of a better idea. Um, and it's an excuse to put up my favorite cartoon uh, on, on theories of change. Um, the number of uh, times you see that as the basic theory of change in, 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 in campaigners. My favorite is, we will distribute lots of information about what is wrong with X, education system, health system, um, and the people will take action to sort it out, right? Lots of information about education, people take action. Absolutely no idea what the miracle is that means that one leads to another. Fascinating conversation in, 12, uh, in East Africa with an NGO who are really rigorous. And they'd started with huge plans, Twaweza, and lots of donor money. And they found after two years of doing this access to information stuff that it had no impact at all. And when they actually analyzed it, they found that they'd made about 17 separate assumptions between people have access to information on how, on the state of education in Tanzania, and people take action. Things like, we're assuming they didn't know this already. Yeah? We're assuming they didn't know the schools were rubbish. Pretty big assumption. We're assuming that they thought, think, if we say something, something will happen. Also, massive assumption. We're assuming, yeah, and then we, we just, they, they, they got some academics to help, and they just teased out all the assumptions. And they looked at them and went, wow, we really should have thought of this in the beginning. Um, so this is the sort of, this is what we're tackling here. So I think we employ many of the wrong kinds of people. Because of the legacy of the cake, a lot of people in the aid business, they like a plan. They like clarity. They want to implement things. They're impatient. They're activists and not reflectivists. Okay? Their reflection is beard stroking. The head of um, uh, advocacy in Oxfam once described my job when I was head of research as beard stroking. And she, like, she was supposed to be my main ally. Um, uh, so, so there's not a great level of curiosity amongst activists. You know, when I went from DFID to Oxfam, I was struck by how much less curiosity there was in Oxfam than there was in DFID, where there's lots of underemployed PhDs who really want to come to seminars. Not the case in Oxfam. And the curiosity we need is about that Afghan map. It's about the system. We want to know the history of the system. We want to know all the little details. The kind of conversations which currently tend to go on in the restaurant or the bar after the day's work need to be brought into the work. That's actually that knowledge, that deep knowledge of what the system is, is crucial to being a change agent. Implications, expats are useless. Okay? They're coming in on two-year rotations. They're never going to know the system. Uh, need to put far more value on local knowledge, whether within staff or local institutions. You know, it's quite, if you take that seriously, it means you do a lot of things differently. Humility, it's very, very hard, because activists are driven by confidence and unconfidence in equal measure. So, you know, if you're, you know, you go up to somebody who's worked their entire life on the tax business, and you say, I'm going to argue with you about tax havens, even though I've just read about it, yeah, this morning, 
you need a, a high level of arrogance to get through that conversation. And there's you know, confrontation after confrontation. How do you combine that with actually a, a real sense of humility and embracing ambiguity and uncertainty? And that, I think a lot of activists find that very difficult. We have to be able to, to ride both horses, I think. Um, reflexivity, you know, the, our Latin American staff basically just want to be strugglists. They want to be part of the people's struggle. And they're not, right? They're on a wage, okay? You know, they've probably got post-grad you know, education. Um, and they're not seen as part of the people's struggle. They're seen as something different, helpful, if we get it right. But you have to be conscious of your own power in the conversation. Amazing research in, uh, in West Africa where they did uh, a, a polls of some kind, and in half the polls they just had black researchers with PDAs doing, the, doing the, the questionnaire. And in the other one, they had a white guy just sitting in the corner. And they got completely different responses when there was a white guy sitting in the corner. You know, power is everywhere, including in our own work. We have to be conscious of that. And you can't make it go away, but you have to be aware of it. Multiple perspectives. So one of the, um, this is the flip chart problem. So one of the things I annoy my colleagues with um, in Oxfam is saying, um, whenever we're talking about yeah, the people in, in some way, and I say, well, you know the institutions that, that poor people everywhere, according to almost all the research, trust above all others, are faith organizations. Not NGOs, not politicians, not social movements, it's faith organizations. So shouldn't we be working far more with faith organizations of different kinds? And they go, yes, absolutely. But somehow it never ends up on the flip chart at the end of the session, yeah? because we have a real inbuilt secular bias. I mean, I, I worked at CAFOD, uh, yeah, the Catholic Aid Agency, and even they have an inbuilt secular bias, which is very confusing, right? So they, it's very hard to actually include genuinely different perspectives. You know, people who actually believe stuff that you think is weird. Um, uh, people who are actually interested in making a lot of money. People with genuinely different perspectives are uh, very hard, but actually we've got a lot of experiences which show that when you, work, when you form alliances with unusual suspects, awkward allies, you get many more interesting results than if you just have 100 NGOs in a room fighting all night over a communique, as I have done a few times. And boy, was that a waste of time. So there is a real sort of richness in diversity and in getting these multiple perspectives. So that's kind of the kinds of people we need to be, I think. And then the questions we ask, you know, policy, practice, norms, what are we trying to change? Fair enough. The second point I think is much more interesting, precedence. So I think there's two kinds of precedents I don't think we ask nearly, we look at nearly enough. The first is historical precedence. When is this, yeah, my rule of thumb is if you're suggesting something which has never worked in history, you might want to think about that. Alternatively, if you're suggesting something which has worked in history and happened a lot, then let's go and look at why and how, because that, we're going to learn a huge amount. The NGOs are all banging on about inequality at the moment. Right? Yeah, inequality is an outrage. It's got to you know, extraordinary extremes. All true. When we just, I spent an afternoon in the British Library uh, looking at where have countries actually redistributed progressively over prolonged periods of time. There are loads of them. You know, I got somebody who's more numerate than me to actually do some number crunching on it, and we identified about 20 countries who in the last 70 years have redistributed for eight years or more in a good direction. No one has gone and looked at those. No one has actually tried to work out what the politics of these redistribution mo moments are, what the politics of how they collapse are, or what the policies that they use are. We're just all going with our own mental map, which is usually a combination of the US and the UK and maybe a bit of Brazil. So just not using history as a kind of source of ideas and, uh, and, 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 sort, of comp and, and sort of nuance, um, but also precedence in the current, in, the, in, in, in today. So there's a fantastic book called The Power of Positive Deviance, which I read as part of, for, for this, um, which is looking at this methodology where you go and look at any really, really difficult problem. Okay? And the way you do it is not to come in with your great ideas. You just say, is the problem universally the same everywhere? And it never is. There's always a distribution, whether it's child malnutrition, um, uh, dropout rates in schools or whatever. And all you say to the people who are actually involved in sorting this out is, is it the same everywhere? And when they say no, say, tell me about the outliers. Tell me about the top 5%. A couple called the Sternins developed this in Vietnam. And they started it 
because they, they were given three months to sort out malnutrition in Vietnam, just after Vietnam had restored relations with the US. And so they had very little time. And they'd just done a, something on, on these positive deviance approaches <laughs> at, at college. So they just went to the most, one of the most uh, underfed villages in Vietnam, got people together and said, are all the kids equally malnourished? People said no. They said, right, go and look at the ones who are, who've got well-nourished kids, see if there's anything different about them. And they found that they were feeding them in different ways, putting a few different things in the pot. And then the next step was they didn't then say, great, let's turn it into a toolkit. They just said, OK, let's put the results up in the commune and see what happens. And then everybody else started doing it. Malnutrition rates came down. No intervention at all. They've done it on FGM. You go to Egypt, 97% of women were cut in Egypt when Monique Stenen went there. Her question was, right, show me the 3%. Let's talk to the 3%. And they developed a whole campaign based on that, what the experiences of the 3% were. It's huge ideas, richness out there already in any issue on any system, and we're ignoring it because we're not interested in precedence. The kind of power I've talked about. And then let's assume, going back to the humility point, that whatever you do is not going to work, or is not going to be perfect at least. How good are your feedback loops? How quickly will you realize that you need to tweak, adjust, change? So in some of our humanitarian responses, there's a kind of well-established system of real-time evaluation where you, everybody downs tools after a month and says, how are we doing? And you're allowed to bring your doubts into the room. You're allowed to re rethink. And if you then say, so we're going to do something differently, you go back to the donors if you need to and adjust the indicators or whatever. We don't have that system in long-term development. We don't have it so well in campaigns. We need to have those kind of moments when you actually stand back and reflect and make and change. You adjust course. And again, yeah, it's something we need to do much better. Have I got time for two graphs? Yeah? OK, so just as quoting Foucault is essential if you're in a university, two by twos are absolutely essential if you work in the aid business. OK, this is the only way we can make sense of anything, as far as I can work out. So here are two. Um, this is one from uh, some, a really good book called Gender at Work, which is uh, a, a team led by Ron Kelleher, who was summarizing 25 years of doing organizational uh, transformation on gender, gender work. Um, it's really good. Um, uh, it's much more interesting than it sounds, I have to say. It's a really good book. Um, and what they, the way they can try and understand the change processes is by on the y-axis saying, is this about individuals or is it about system change? And on the x-axis, is this in the kind of formal world of policies and sort of government action, or is it in the informal world of you know, how people feel? If you're working with individuals in the formal world, then you're likely to be working on things like resources, livelihoods, you know, wages, sort of stuff, which, which is fairly tangible. If you're working systemic in the formal world, then you're talking about laws and policies. And most of our thinking takes place in this half of the graph. Come over here, in the informal world, systemic, social norms. I increasingly think social norms are probably are massively under, underestimated in terms of their importance and probably one of the areas where the progressive movement in development, however you define that, has had most impact in the last 30, 40 years. I wrote a book on the rights of children where you could really see that the way people understood what is a child has been changing very fast in historical terms over the last 30 years since the Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989. Similar on violence against women and other aspects of gender. So social norms. And here, it's, that, it's the light bulb stuff. It's the consciousness, capabilities, power within. And what um, Rao and Kelleher say is that if you look at any change process, it often moves between these, but it helps to just have a sense that all four need to be thought about. And then the second one is actually a much more recent um, one, which came up with a, in one of the few good conferences I've been to recently. I really hate conferences, but um, this one was very well designed, and they gave us tasks, and, and everybody had to really think very, very hard. Not my normal experience in conferences. And um, this was uh, working with a group of people from DFID and USAID and, other, and others saying, OK, how do you choose your approach? Um, let's put it on two by two where you're fairly sure you understand the context. You know, you've worked in this country or this place for a long time. You kind of know the players. You know what you're doing. Or 
at the other end of the spectrum, it's all a fog. You know, um, Somalia, what the hell is going on? You know, who's going to attack us next? We don't know. We, we don't have. We don't have time. Haven't spent time here. We're making it up as we go along. And then on the intervention, is this a? Are you pretty confident on this intervention? Is it a cash transfer kind of approach, which you've done in loads of countries and you've seen it basically works, or is it actually quite experimental? You're trying something out. If you're in a, if you're confident on the intervention, and you're fairly sure you understand the context, it's okay. You can do a log frame. You're in cake country. Okay. Okay. You need feedback to check, right? But it's all right. You know, log frames are not entirely useless. Unfortunately, the aid business assumes that the whole of the graph is like this. But in this in this space, as long as you've got feedback and you check regularly, you do your projects. That's fine. If you're confident on the intervention, but you're not sure about the context, say you're doing cash transfers in Somalia, right? If there's a, a shift in the military situation and, you, and everybody runs away from one place and runs to another, you don't think, oh, maybe cash transfers don't work. You think, okay, I need to do them. I need to follow, go where the people are. So you need fast feedback and response, but you can carry on with the same intervention you know, until, until proven wrong, you know. Um, if you're pretty sure you understand the context, but you're not confident on the intervention, then you need to go all venture capitalist. Okay? You need to try lots of different things at once and have a system for sorting which ones are working best after a certain length of time. This is something that hardly ever happens in the aid business. I've seen it once in one Oxfam project, and it worked really well. Um, and especially when we called it a venture capitalist approach, if it gave us another million dollars because it was private sector language. Um, but we need to do much more of that. If you don't know what's going to work, then try lots of things. That's how evolution works. You want to speed up the rate of variation and then select for fitness. Now, what happens when you don't know what's going on and you don't know what you're doing? Okay? This is like probably far too common uh, in the aid world. Well, one option is to get out. You know, simplify the intervention so you're up there. Study the context really hard so you get there. But actually, this is when positive deviance comes into its own because, you know, as the Sternins write in that book, the only time they ever get called in is when everything else has failed. And that's when they get, they get called in to sort out the MRSA bug in US um, uh, hospitals, FGM in Ethiopia, or whatever. And actually, you don't need to understand the context or be confident on the intervention if you're just looking at what works in that place. So it's not, you know, there is, there is hope. Uh, oh, yes, I was asked to add this slide because this was a conference about poverty reduction, right? Sorry, so a random connection with poverty reduction, because I always do what I'm told. Um, I think, yeah, I'm a big fan of multidimensional approaches to poverty rather than income. That's fairly passe, you know, everybody's got that. But I think if you're going to go multidimensional, you have to go way beyond, well, let's stick in some education and health. Okay? You need to think about power and sort of uh, agency, efficacy, um, and how that goes over a whole life cycle. I think the, one of the, one of the, the, I think one of the under, um, one of the exercises which should have got a lot more traction than it has is the chronic poverty work, uh, which has been going, going on, which looks at things like life cycle, moments of vulnerability, critical junctures in people's own lives, and what happens with that. So understanding how change goes on in lives of poor people, really important. Resilience, you know, is another buzzword which everybody's talking about, but I think it is really useful because resilience is a system property um, and it's resilience to shocks and how you're able to use shocks rather than just be afflicted by them, I think is, a, again, a useful way of thinking about poverty in systems way. Um, what I don't quite get, and, and you know, maybe people got ideas in, uh, now, is, is if you're talking about poverty, it still tends to be quite an individualized aspect. So how do you capture systems feature, features, you know, the enabling environment for getting out of poverty when you're talking about poverty? Or is it something else entirely? I don't, I, I, I'm just not sure about, oh, uh, but it feels like something we need to think about. Well, I think that probably means that it's the end. Oh, no, yeah, that, it is the end. Okay, so that's it. Thanks very much.